Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends from near and far. Thanks so much for joining us today um, for the Star Center monthly webinar um, this, this month on recruiting with career fairs. We are so glad to have you here. Appreciate the time that you take out of your day uh, to listen in uh, from someone from the field, a friend and colleague of your own. Um, and really want to thank you for, in general, staying tuned in to what's happening at the STAR Center as it relates to recruitment and retention at health centers. As you all know, the STAR Center is a project of the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. We are one of a network of national cooperative agreements who receives funding from the Bureau of Primary Health Care to provide free training and technical assistance to you all. So you can visit our website anytime at chcworkforce.org to find out more about upcoming trainings, resources, and technical assistance opportunities. Uh, today, we are thrilled to have uh, the Pennsylvania Association of Community Health Centers with us to share their experience. Uh, we have Judd mellinger Blauk. He is the director of the Pennsylvania Primary Care Career Center, which is part of the Pennsylvania Association of Community Health Centers. That career center helps community health centers, rural health clinics, and other organizations recruit and retain physicians, dentists, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and other primary care providers. Prior to joining the Career Center in March 2014, Mr. mellinger Block was the Director of Marketing Communications at the Pennsylvania Medical Society and has worked in healthcare since 1986. He's joined today by his colleague Amanda, who was the manager of events and communications at the Pennsylvania Association of Community Health Centers. Um, but before she took that role at PAC, um, she was serving as the recruitment coordinator with Judd. So she has lots of skills and knowledge to share with us today, too. So um, thanks for your attention. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please go ahead and uh, type them into the chat box to uh, Mariah Blake, who's going to run um, questions on technical problems. If you have any questions for Judd or Amanda, you can put those in the questions box on the right. Um, and there are, in the handouts box on the right, there are copies of today's presentation and other handouts for your download um, if you want to find out more and follow back up with Judd. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Judd. Let me know if you have any problems advancing the slides, Judd. Okay. Thanks, Allison. And we're off and running. And I just want to say, as Allison says, hello, friends. And glad we could be here today to share this with you. Um, as some of you may know, Allison is one of my predecessors here at the Pennsylvania Association of Community Health Centers, so I'm following in her footsteps. And it, she did a great job getting things rolling here way back when, and so it's a pleasure to, always a pleasure to work with Allison and her group. And I am joined by Amanda Ticali, who is our events and planning, uh, events and marketing coordinator, and she has been very instrumental in helping to plan these, both as a recruitment coordinator and now as our events manager. So it's great to have her here. We would welcome questions the whole way through this. Uh, if you have questions that you want to ask, and you can post those uh, on the, on the um, webinar page there. And just in, uh, I guess we won't be interrupting, but we will be answering questions throughout and at the end. And actually, after this is over, our contact information is on the, on the last slide. We'll be happy to have more conversations with you, send you more information, whatever you would find helpful in doing this. So just quickly about the Pennsylvania Primary Care Career Center. It's a cooperative effort of the, Pen of the Pennsylvania Association of Community Health Centers and the Department of Health. And we're funded in a large part by the Department of Health to work at recruiting and retaining Pennsylvania uh, primary care career primary care providers, excuse me, in Pennsylvania. And part of our work agreement with the Department of Health stipulates that we have that we hold career fairs. And actually, it was pretty prescriptive. the The first work agreement ends uh, at the end of June. And we we're going to launch into a second three-year work agreement. The first work agreement was pretty prescriptive about what exactly we should do. And we've really altered that with their permission, working with them. We've altered what we're doing uh, to 
try to make it work better. So fortunately, in the second work agreement that's coming up, the second three-year work agreement, the language has been broadened to be less prescriptive and give us some more leeway in, in how we're doing this. So what we'll cover today, very briefly, we'll run through what, how our primary care career fairs have evolved, where we started and where we're at now, and where we think we're heading. We'll talk about setting expectations and measures of, measures of success. And I think this is important. Well, you'll see why it's important, but I think it's something to stop and think about rather than just barging ahead. But it's one of those things that it, it pays to stop and think a little bit about. And then we'll talk about planning and what all goes into that to get the career fairs uh, up and running in a way and can get them started in a way that um, will raise the expectation, raise the possibility of success. Talk about marketing to candidates and employers, and then we'll also talk about the experience for candidates and, and employers and employees, uh, candidates and employers. I'm sorry, that's a typo there. So we, because that's just something we've really been focusing on more the past year or two, instead of instead of just putting a bunch of people in a room and hoping something good happens. Really trying to think about what's going on in that room and making and trying to trying to raise the possibilities and the and the probability of success. So, and one caveat that I would say is this is our experience. It may not work for you, and frankly, we're still trying to make it really work for us. This is a work in progress, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. The career MDs and the practice link career fairs, practice match career fairs, they might have a formula. We don't have that formula yet, and I don't know if we ever will. But this is what works for us, and I hope you can gather something from it. So the evolution of the career fair. It started out when Allison, I believe Allison, you did the first ones. Um, it started out as a as some, something that was centrally located in Harrisburg, which is our capital. And in case you're not familiar with Pennsylvania's geography, it's pretty much in the middle of the state, particularly uh, population-wise, in the middle of the state. Uh, folks in the western part of the state think we're think Harrisburg's in the eastern part of the state, and people in the eastern part of the state think we're in the western part of the state. So that must mean that it's centrally located. So the idea really was that if you if you put together a good day long program, and you had a you had some educational components to it, and you provided scholarship money to the to uh, residents and students, that they would come to Harrisburg for this. And there was some attendance, but it really wasn't enough to make it to make it work, to make it keep it going. One of the things we find in in Pennsylvania, at least, is that people really are only willing to drive an hour and a half to two hours to get to anything, and that's particularly true in the in the eastern part of the state. They will not drive to Harrisburg for something when there's already so many options in Philadelphia. The folks in Pittsburgh and Erie and so forth, they will. They will tend to drive a little bit more, but not to Harrisburg, probably. So that didn't, that didn't really work out that well. So the, for the past three years, we've done two career fairs, one in Philadelphia and one in Pittsburgh. The numbers of employers has grown, but the number of candidates has not. Uh, there's lots of competition, particularly for physicians. Both cities, however, train a lot of health care providers. We know the people are out there. We know that we get plenty of people contacting us outside of career fairs looking for looking for jobs. And so not plenty, I shouldn't say plenty. We get we get some. We never have enough. But we so we know they're there. So it's a matter of really making the contact and getting them into the room and getting them engaged. So that's where we're at right now with Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. We're 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 making some changes this year in Pittsburgh that I'll that I'll get to. In the future, we'll see how this year goes, but we're also thinking about doing some smaller career fairs in more uh, more rural or more uh, outside of locations in Pennsylvania that are outside of these two major metropolitan areas. Uh, if, you know, here in Harrisburg, we have Penn State's College of Medicine not far away up in the northeast part of the state. There's a there's the Commonwealth College of Medicine northwest. There's Lake Erie College of Medicine, and then nurse practitioner and PA programs throughout the state. So we're looking at possibly trying to hit those schools with maybe smaller career fairs. So that's where that, that's where we're at right now where it looks like where we're heading. 
So when I when I opened up, I talked about the importance of setting goals and expectations and uh, somewhat how we how we measure. And we have a long way to go with this, I think, uh, particularly in in measuring what the success. But something that we try to keep in mind is what are people what what is it what is a reasonable expectation of success at at a career fair? And I think sometimes some of our employers and quite frankly my I'll include myself in that to some degree, feel like it's not a success unless you get on the spot hires or you get hot in, hot candidates uh, interviewing very shortly after after the career fair. And uh, that's really not what what constitutes a successful career fair. I think that there, there's a lot that you can you can quantify success through numbers, but you also have to quantify it through um, Less, less quant well, not quantify it, qualify it through through the, the feeling in the room, the number of quality quality interactions employers had, the possibilities for the future of of employing folks and, and getting actual employees. Last year in Pittsburgh, which I'm going to get into a little bit, we didn't have we didn't have a really good turnout, and I turned to one of my uh, we, we turned to one of my HR director slash recruiters from a, one of the more successful, one of the larger F2HCs in Pennsylvania, and I said, "Boy, I, you know, that was a little disappointing." And she said, "No." She said, "That wasn't. We have we had two or three good conversations, and we have one or two possible interviews." She said, "That was worth it, worth our while." And their drive to Pittsburgh—they have about a three-hour drive to Pittsburgh from their centrally located, not far from Harrisburg—and they were pleased. And to me, the the, the, that career fair was not did not go well, and to them, it was fine. They had they had gotten something worthwhile out of their investment, and that's really what's important. So, and I think um, I think one of the things that that happens that one of the, the goals for for the candidates at these career fairs is really just to get to know people and walk around and check people out. Whereas the employers often, particularly the smaller career. Uh, FQHCs who are having a tougher time at recruiting, they they are really desperate for people, and we try to make sure. I think one of the things we need to emphasize to them is not to appear that way, um, and so we're we're trying to keep keep expectations realistic, and at the same time trying to really shoot for success. But I think it's it's important to think that through before you get before you. Get to the career fair, and, and when you look at, particularly when you look at reporting afterwards, when you report back to your to your board or you report back to your funders, like we have to do. Okay, so budget planning and venue. We want to talk a bit about planning and how we plan this. One of the critical things that we that was formed before before I came on board, and I've continued to work with them and expanded a bit, is a steering committee. And this steering committee basically are shareholders. People who, stakeholders, I mean, uh, people and organizations who whose members have a stake in the success of the career fair. I also have a workforce committee that reports to the board uh, as part of the PA Association of Community Health Centers, and they also have input on the career fairs and give me feedback because they are made up of employers and HR directors and recruiters and so forth. But this steering committee, which is it consists of representatives of associations of family practitioners and uh, nurse practitioners, PAs, hospitals. I actually have a representative on there from the Hospital Association of Pennsylvania, representative from the Dentist, Dentist Association, the Pennsylvania Dental Association, and a couple of, of AHEC coordinators, regional AHEC coordinators, and basically anyone else that you think might be helpful. They're really good at promoting the, the the event and getting the word out to their members in varying degrees, of course. Some of them are much more active. Some of them are not. Um, our folks at the Pennsylvania Academy of Family Practice really do a great job. The, PA, the physician assistant group does a great job. Interestingly, my former employer, the Pennsylvania Medical Society, dropped out this year because they weren't they weren't getting to contact enough doctors when they were at the career fair. And I would, I, I tried to, to to reinforce them that their job really was to help get doctors to the career fair, not take advantage of it. 
but they didn't want to hear it, so they dropped out, which was a little sad. But they really weren't helping me out much to begin with, so that, I guess that's okay. Uh, I think one of the things last year with the steering committee that really helped and really helped planning, and I'll, I'll, I'll refer to them this as I go along a little bit more, is we added two family practice resident resident physicians uh, through my contact with the Pennsylvania Association's family practice. She suggested, it, and it really worked out well, to add two family resident family medicine residents. And they were really helpful. They were really helpful. They, they couldn't participate in the steering committee meetings much because we hold them during the day. But we got on the phone with them a, a couple times, and they were helpful in getting people out and also giving us some input on how to, on how to uh, shape this up. The financials, the, like I said earlier, the budget, most of the budget comes from our association with the, dental, with the Department of Health. And we're spending about $4,000 per site for the meeting and the, the big the big cost is the food for the meeting. The meeting rooms itself aren't aren't that expensive, but the big cost is the food. And the, the food and the beverage. Uh, we do not have alcoholic beverages. We that might be a way if you can afford it or if you can, you're allowed to do it. Might be a way to get more more people in the room if you have a bar. But we have decided not to do that. That's not what this is, event is about. And uh, we do also want to make it a family event so it's so, but if uh, that that would that would be one thing we could we could put put in there perhaps uh, in the future. I don't know, but uh, we've talked about uh, other ways to to attract doctors and so forth. But that's not one of them. Um, so the, the the cost is about four thousand dollars per per space. We also charge our vendors to exhibit there and. The, we charge our. We have early bird special. I, I'm going to get into some of the pricing a little bit later. But the, the basic price for our members is only $100. But it's kind of a placeholder. It gives them some, some skin in the game. And then we charge more for for health systems and private practices and so forth that show up. So, uh, like I said, all, most of our dollars go towards the food and the, and the food and beverage. And also, we we also offer. We also have some giveaways and some um, premiums that we that we offer to try to keep them there, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So, so that money goes in that. Oh, also, we we we've uh, determined that free parking is absolutely essential. So, particularly for uh, in Philadelphia, that's a big deal because parking is very expensive. If you don't if you if you don't park, well, parking is very expensive. Period. I don't care where you park in Philadelphia. And so to offer free parking really is, is very helpful to get people there. Otherwise, um, they would hop in their car. If they're in their car and they're thinking about coming to the career fair, and then they think about, then they think about the price, the cost of parking, they just might keep driving and head home. So, and we don't want that to happen. Amanda, you want to talk a little bit about choosing a venue? Sure. There are some key things that you need to know whenever you choose a venue. Um, the first thing is that you need to know your location, and that includes the venue itself as well as the area you're going in. For example, we have Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. So as far as our venues go, we want to make sure that the space of the venue will, will hit the size of how many attendees that we expect to have as well as um, how many exhibitors we're going to have there. Uh, as far as the area goes, um, in Philadelphia, we look for something that's walkable. It's close to public transportation. As Judd was kind of mentioning, in Philadelphia, they tend not to drive as much, and we kind of know that about the area, that they're going to jump on mass transit, and that's how they're going to get to our career fair. For Pittsburgh, we look for parking. Again, parking is key in Pittsburgh. Uh, parking is minimal, um, and it's something, again, that Judd had mentioned that we pay for. And this year, we're actually moving to more of a central location in Pittsburgh. When you're shopping for a venue, you also want to know your date or your date ranges. If you have a specific month that you're looking for, day of the week, it doesn't have to necessarily be a specific date. But if you know it's the first few weeks in September, I only want Tuesday through Thursday, and just shop that around to your venue. It's easier to, whenever you contact them, if you know that ahead of time, or if you're sending in an electronic request for a proposal. You also need to know your budget. And not only do you need to factor in the cost of the venue space, but you want to think about food, uh, beverages, 
parking or any other rental fees. Sometimes tables uh, will be charged a fee or if you have any sort of AV needs. You also need to know your audience. Uh, you'll need to know the number of attendees or at least an estimate of attendees and vendors whenever you're shopping for a space so that you can make sure that the venue is going to fit your needs. Uh, the exact number of attendees can vary, and one of the things we've noticed from our career fairs is that if we open it up to a broader uh, audience as far as the exhibitors we're bringing in for the career fair, it's going to attract more attendees. Um, just one more thing I forgot to mention. When you said, Amanda, when you said dates, you know your dates, that is something that the, the steering committee has helped us refine a bit. And we started out, when I, when I the first year we did these, we, the general feeling was Friday nights would be good. And that being that people have, are done with their week, they're ready to go do something like a career fair, and they'll do that on their way home on a Friday night. And we've tried Friday nights, I think last year we did Pittsburgh on a Friday night too, right? We tried Friday nights twice in Pittsburgh, and the, the, the attendance just keeps going down. And it, actually, we found that we're going to try. We're going to try weeknights. I know some people are holding career fairs. I know Career MD is holding career fairs on Saturdays. Uh, we haven't gone there yet, and um, I'm hoping we don't have to go there, quite frankly. But if we do, we do. And but we're, we're moved, we've moved both of our career fairs now to Thursday night from 5:30 to 8. And we what what happens honestly? What happens? There, no, hardly anybody comes to the beginning and stays to the end. We had one TA in Pittsburgh who did that last year, and I think that was the only one we ever had. And But people come in, they walk around the room, they get a feel, they might get some food, they might sit down and talk with some people for a little bit, and then they're gone. Uh, but we're, we're, we think that right now for us, weeknights work better, and staying away from the weekend and weekend travel and and also football weekends because we were at, we were at, at the on the campus of University of Pittsburgh last year, and we're close to University. Of, we're right off the campus of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia with that with our Philadelphia venue. So, so that's uh, so dates are really and day of the week is really important. Uh, you also want to stay away from and just keep in mind when people are when people are at the schools and when they're not. And so having it over the summer, even though that might be convenient for us, and you know, holding it in September, we're we're a month out from our annual meeting, so it is not a great time for us to be doing this as far as workload is concerned. But it really seems to fit well for our our employers and our candidates. And one more thing with uh, dates, you also want to be mindful of things that are happening at the areas that you're choosing. Um, for example. When we're in Pittsburgh, we're mindful of whenever they have football games. We know that that's going to be a large attraction, um, and it's going to keep people from getting to the, the career fair. Right. Okay. So candidate marketing. So this is where the this is where the rubber starts hitting, hitting the road a little bit and trying to get people to show up. And we don't have a whole lot of money to do this. We don't. We so we we have to do it through some of the lower cost methods that are out there. But we try to make it look nice. And you can see the uh, what, what I have here on the screen is, I think I this is one of the items you have in your materials for the, for the webinar, is a flyer that we did. And we, we actually customized this. This is the one for, this is the one for all primary care providers. Um, I haven't determined yet whether I'm going to do a customized one this year or not. But we did one for, for dentists, physicians, TAs and, and CRMPs, and then distributed those to the various programs. We sent a, a, a copy, or we sent a stack of copies to the various programs, and to, for them to distribute. But uh, and that's fairly low cost. We have a local artist who who designs that for us, and is, we're picking out a new logo for this year. It's going to look very, it's going to look somewhat more like like the one you see there. But we're but we're uh, we want to maybe add a little bit of color this year. But I think the, 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 the marketing techniques that you see listed there are, for the most part, in order of what I feel is effectiveness. I think really key to us growing our, our career fairs is networking and getting to know directors of programs and educators and, 
and professors and so forth. So they recognize the name of the the name of the, of the career center. They recognize my my name, or they recognize my recruitment coordinator now, Shelley Ayler's, when she's when when she's reaching out to them. So it's really really important that they that they know that they recognize that and that we're networking. And the, and the steering committee really is key for that. And as really as time goes on, I my network, our net, I should say our network has really increased, but it, could really, it it has a long way to go yet. I look back on when I first started in this job and I didn't recognize hardly any names at all. I didn't know if, if programs were still up and running. I didn't know if new programs had started. And I, I feel like I really have a much better feel for that now and that they'll listen to me, they'll 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 pass this information along to their to their students and residents. And that's really what you're looking for with your network. You're looking for these folks, these key influencers, to pass this information along to their to their students and residents. And and kind of give us their 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 endorsement, if you will, by passing that along and saying to their when when, when we have a, a when we have a, a residency director or a professor of nurse and a nurse practitioner program member say to their people this is something that's really good. These folks are really on the up and up. They aren't. This is not nonprofit. This because we are different, and that's when we see people sign up from the network is when they get we get that endorsement. So we also have a contact list that we're constantly updating, revising. This really does have to do with networking. Also ties in very closely through the networking. We're we're able to update that list. We're able to see when somebody's email gets kicked back and 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 act on that and get a, get a new contact. But again, the steering committee is very critical to help us get, get good contacts. And people on our list, really, they, it's amazing how willing they are to help us sometimes. And it's very, very encouraging. And it does make a difference that we're working with underserved populations and that we're, we're serving folks like that. And not, we're not a big, we're not big uh, health systems or for-profit hospitals or something like that. So that helps. We do a lot of email marketing. We reach out to our 3 rnet and practice work. We, we, we participate in practice link. We reach out to those to folks on those on, in those databases. In fact, it, this year I'm, I'm hoping practice link is even more effective because we, um, we we've been working it now for a year, and hopefully we have a we have a longer list of, of candidates. We also have. Uh, in addition to 3RNet practice link, we have also converted from practice sites to contact intelligence. So we have a list of candidates in there that we can pull up. So one of the things there, of course, is that there's a lot of crossover, particularly between 3RNet and, con and our contact intelligence database. So we need to make sure that we're not sending people multiple emails. Um, we also try to get uh, friends to forward the email. We need to go out to to, um, to people who are friendly with medical with the with the Career Center and get them to forward those those emails. So you know, I would just one of the questions you can ask yourself is who is who is on who do I have an email list of? Who's on my email list? Who can I reach out to? Who am I communicating with? And reach out to them and and see if they can pass along your message for you because that's really what you're what you're looking for. We do a web page for this. Uh, it's, I think I, I did revise it on our on our website, and one one of the things that I think was important with that, and this comes from those folks who were those residents who we put on our steering committee, is is to put information on there that helps candidates prepare for the for the career fair, so they're not coming in in blind. And finally, we're we're look, working more with social media, and uh, Amanda, you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, currently, the Career Center has Facebook and Twitter pages, as well as a LinkedIn page. Uh, so last year during the Career Affairs, Facebook and Twitter was utilized to market. Um, just frequency of postings is key there. Uh, something that can help you with that would be a, a program called Hootsuite, uh, where you can go on and schedule your tweets and your Facebook posts in advance. It's free for up to three social media sites. So if you have Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, you can link all those in Hootsuite um, and schedule your posts in advance. It's something that uh, is easily done, and um, I understand that it's easy to 
let posts kind of slip away from your schedule. So um, for me, as far as communications goes, I try and do that once a week, say on Monday mornings, I schedule a bunch of tweets and a bunch of posts uh, for the rest of the week. Something that Jed and I are discussing was yesterday was um, going into maybe Pinterest uh, for posting tips on resume building or uh, interviewing skills as far as the Career Center career fair promotion goes. Uh, we also talked a little bit about using YouTube uh, to post uh, little snippets of the vendors, just introducing themselves so that the candidates can get to know who's going to be at the career fair. And another tool is Periscope, which is a live stream that's linked with Twitter, so you can actually live stream the career fair. And I would just, some of it, it, it it's interesting to, to look at what, what social media you think might be effective, and then look at your audience and say, well, is that the right one? Because my experience is, we, you know, you notice that LinkedIn is, is not on there. Uh, my experience has been that that for residents and and, and students, LinkedIn is not a, is not a commonly used commonly used tool in in healthcare right now. It's more for folks like us who've been in it for a while or in management positions. But and and on the other hand, Pinterest would be one that I, I would not. I'm I'm not anticipating that that's going to be effective at all for physicians. But my experience is that a lot of CRMPs coming out of school have been have been RNs for a while, and then they went to school, and they now they're coming out um, in their mid 30s, early 40s, something along that line, and they may have Pinterest accounts for for other for hobbies, for cooking, for for raising families. Many of them are female. Not to say that all people on Pinterest are female, but it is a heavily female audience. So knowing your audience and using your and, and picking up social media channels, there could be some real some real um, usefulness to that. Okay, so that's that's candidate that's candidate marketing, and we can talk about that some more. Again, always evolving, always trying to find new things to do. I had mentioned earlier about the candidate experience and trying to focus more in on that. And one of the things that struck me last year when we were planning this, and this came from one of those family medicine residents was thinking about the candidates, and, partic and particularly physicians, but also the other candidates, as scientists who do research and who have been, who have a science background and have, uh, and do not, uh, and also do not like to go into a room full of people and not be prepared. That is not what, that is not what, what, what flips, uh, what, 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 uh, what turns them on or what, what works for them uh, as a as a marketer, as a as a as a gregarious person, that doesn't bother me at all. But as a as somebody who is in who is in science and who has done research and is looked upon to be an expert, they want to be able to do a little research ahead of time and be prepared when they go in. And we found that to be true to, to for a number of our candidates. If they come in, they might have something already printed out from the website. They they come in and, and they have a they have some employers already in mind that they'd like to talk to. And so we did that we, on our on our web page. We had a list of, of all the employers who were coming and a link to their website. We'd like to do more of that this year, actually, and, and prepare them for that. We also think it's really important to make this an enjoyable, uh, low-stress kind of environment. These folks have enough stress in their lives, and so we're trying to make it friendly, and I think we do a good job with that, welcoming people it's not it's not a big commercial venture that they're coming into. It's a it's a it's kind of a family environment, and we also we also welcome families people to bring their families. Most people don't, but we do have some people who bring their kids. Uh, we had one CRMP candidate last year in Philadelphia who showed up, I think, with four or five kids in tow. I think one was a that might have been a niece, and then helping her babysit her kids, and they they were fine. They came in and they they, they got some food and they. And they, and they, you know, and they went around and, and, and probably picked up a lot of freebies off the off the employers' tables, but nobody seemed nobody seemed to mind that at all. And so we we, we encourage families to come. We really specifically uh, encourage people's spouses and partners to to be with them because obviously employment choices are are uh, a decision that needs to be made by. By a couple, or if that if that exists, or or in, in a family situation. 
So the food we offer is not nothing fancy, but but we we want to make sure it's it's good. And so the hotels do a nice job with that, giving us reasonably priced food. And we what we concentrate on is heavy or basically heavy hors d'oeuvres that people can make a meal out of, and and some some nice sweets like cookies or something like that, and, and coffee, and making sure there's plenty of coffee there that that gets hit pretty hard, and something to drink. So. The other thing we, we try to do is we want people to stick around and have some sort of educational component. We're actually supposed to be doing doing this as these are supposed to be not just career fairs and employment opportunities, but actual career education. So we do a few things with that. We, we have some giveaways and premiums there to get people involved and to try to, we, we hold off pulling the, the names for these until later in the evening. So that, uh, and one of the premiums we, we've given away at both locations, we we, we have we have funds where we can buy uh, a mini iPad to give away at each location, and that tends to get people. And you got to be present to win, so we get, it tends to get people to stick around. And also a bunch of uh, gift cards, the Visa the Visa General gift cards. One thing we got some advice uh, a couple years ago from our steering committee that that they thought we should also we should have a mix of Visa cards and Starbucks cards. And I thought, oh, great, Starbucks cards. Well, when we started giving these things out, everybody wanted the Visa cards. And the Starbucks cards, OK, I got a Starbucks card. But a Visa card, you could take and take it anyway, anywhere. So we actually had some people like giving other people their Starbucks cards that they want because they don't drink coffee. So um, so I would, I would recommend those, like $25. And then we have some $25 and then a couple $50 gift cards that we give away. But anything you can do to, to keep people there. And we also we also do see offer offer reviews of CVs, resumes, and cover letters, and we collect those at the career fairs, and then we send out critiques afterward. It takes us a few weeks to go through them and get them back. Shelley's particularly good at that, and doing and and looking them through, and that also helps us to form a bond with the with the candidates who ask us to do that. So the educational component has evolved also. We, in the past, up until last year, we had a panel discussion at the end of the evening and then have the drawing for the, for the, for the premiums, for the, for the giveaways at the end of the panel discussion. And the panel was made up of providers from FQHCs. And that went OK, but it, what we had was a lot of talk, people sitting across the front of the room, the panel, talking. Very few questions, and people kind of sitting there saying, OK, when are you pulling the name for the iPad? And so it really wasn't that great an educational experience, in my opinion. So last year, we had roundtables where you could sit and talk with. We had, we had providers sit at the, at the tables and have conversations throughout the evening. And that seemed to work well. And so we're probably going to feed off of that this year and do something um, in, addition, in addition to that this year. I think one of the things we're going to do is we're going to try to get some folks who are involved in funding uh, loan repayment there. The National Health Service Corps has been there before, but we also have the, the, the administrator for the uh, Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program is actually located right here in Harrisburg. The national uh, administrator for that is the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency, or FIA, um, is actually the, the national administrator for that. So we're going to try to get those folks to go out and be there to talk to people about loan repayment, and I think we're we're going to be publicizing that, and I think that might draw some other some some other people in who are interested in finding out more about how to get these nasty loans all paid off. Okay, moving right along, we're getting not too short on time, but we're moving right along here. And Allison, I don't know if we have any questions or anything. Should I stop and and wait to hear if there's any questions? Uh, so far, the main question is, when can I share this recording with my health centers? <laughs> so um, oh, you're doing great. People are excited. And just so people know, the uh, recording will be made available by tomorrow uh, via email and our website. OK. All right, very good. Um, well, that's great to hear. So so I'll, I'll try to, you know, I, I told Allison I, wasn't, I was going to tell all my Trump jokes, but I'll, I'll hold off those since we're going to be sharing the recording with people. So I, I'll make sure I don't crack any. Any bad jokes? So, employer marketing tactics. We really do. We really. You would think this is kind of one of those things where you might think 
if I offer this and it's only 100 bucks to come, they'll all be standing in line asking, asking me when they can sign up. And I wish it could say that's true, but at most of our, we, we do have fairly good attendance, but, but there's a lot of our community health centers who uh, don't come, and there's others who we have to kind of cajole into coming to this. And I think this, this year is going to be no different because um, we've, you know, we continue to, we continue to try to build this. And so, but if we only charge $100 for, for our FQHCs to come before July 1, we, we do an early bird special. And then, after, and then it's, and it's $250 for non-PAC members. Um, we also include in that, in that discount, we also include rural health clinics and critical access hospitals and any kind of veterans health services. Um, we took out the 501c3 nonprofit organization this year because we're going to take that out off the flyer because last year we had Temple Health System come to us and say, we're a nonprofit. Why can't we get that $100 off? And I, that was when I changed it to 501c3. And I'm just taking off nonprofit organizations this year. Those suckers have got to pay the full freight <laughs> if they're going to come to this. Um, and uh, we, also, we also market this to AFPR members. And there's a local version, there's a regional version of ASPR, the Mid-Atlantic uh, Staff Physician Recruiters Association. So we'll be, recruit, we'll be uh, going, we'll be marketing to them. Like I said, we offer, the, we offer the early bird special. And then after the early bird special, we, last year, I think we'll do it this year, we offer a two-for-one special, too, so that they can come to both our career fairs for um, a price I forget exactly what I charged last year. I think I charged uh, 750 for hospitals to come to both of them, and it might have been 450 or 400 or something like that for FQHCs to come to both of them after July 1. So it, it, it's got to be more than what they would pay if they paid gotten the early bird special, but less than what it would pay if they paid full freight for both of them. So the other issue that we've had with marketing this and is, do we invite everyone, to all, all employers to this, or just FQHCs and rural health clinics, uh, because we, we allow rural health clinics as members of the, of the Pennsylvania Association of Community Health Centers. And the, the reason why we go with everyone, there's a couple, there's two, two reasons. First of all, we feel like we have to, because we're funded by the Department of Health. And our, our, our mission is not, to, is not to recruit and retain primary health care providers for FQHCs alone, it's to, it's to increase primary care access in Pennsylvania. And because of that, we feel, like, we feel like we need to offer this to all primary health care employers. And so, so it, that has not sat well with some of our FQHCs. We had some complaints this year. We, I took it to, the, to our workforce committee, and we made a determination that we, that we needed to keep offering it for this for the second reason, and that is that the more employers you have, the more candidates you're going to have show up because they're going to look at the website, they're going to look at who you have, who you have to, who's going to be there, and they're going to make a determination about whether it's worth their while or not. And if you have five or six FQHCs in a room in Pittsburgh, I'll guarantee you you're going to have, you'll, you'll, we'll have ten or ten or fifteen candidates show up, and those are the only ones because because they have no options. People want options, so. Uh, we're, so we're sticking with that, and we're trying to we're trying to um, we're, we're trying to communicate that to to our members who were who were upset last year, um, and I think and that leads me to the employer experience. So what we you know, it, as we think about inviting these folks to this, and we have we have folks from a uh, an FQHC with two sites in in rural Pennsylvania standing next to recruiters from University of Pittsburgh, the UPMC system, or next to recruiters from Geisinger, or next to recruiters from the Penn State Health System. You know, we, we need to help. What we're going to be doing this year is we're really looking at ways we can help our members compete and succeed at these career fairs, and maybe in that way help them realize what they need to do to compete and succeed in the, in the recruitment market alone. Um, some of the things we're thinking about, we're looking at doing, is really uh, how we position them in the room. Uh, so 
in the past, we basically, I, you know, at the beginning of the evening, before, before all the employers show up, I take a stack of, bis of tent cards and I walk around the room and I, you know, just put them around the room. Um, and if somebody hasn't asked to be next to somebody or whatever, that were, whatever the order that the cards were in, that's, the, that's where they were in the room. And I think we can do a much better job of that, of, of positioning our employers, not only in, in spots, well, first of all, in spots where when somebody walks in the door, they're, they're going to see them. They're not tucked away in a corner. But also putting our health centers together so they can, they can work together in a way that, so if they, they talk to somebody, if a, one health center is talking to a candidate and that candidate says, I really would like to be in the, the Harrisburg area. Um, and if that that employee that community health center is in Philadelphia, but they're next to the next to Hamilton Health Clinic, which is here in, in Harrisburg, they can say, you know what, I'm in Philadelphia, but this person next to us is from Hamilton. Want, let's let me take you over and introduce you to, to this person, and they can they can help each other in that way. Uh, we also need to offer them some best practices. We have a couple of health centers who do excellent jobs at these community health at these career fairs. Um, working the candidates and working the room, and really, really, really selling their selling their career, their community health center, and so we need to we need to be tying into that and helping them helping these community health centers have better tables and better displays. Um, using the checking, we're oh we're also going to be using a check-in card this year. This is that something we're definitely using. This is a card to qualify for our drawing. So I mentioned earlier, they're going to have to go around to just, it's going to be just PAC members that they're going to go around to and get that colored in. Uh, so they have to talk, and that way they have to talk to our members, and I'm hoping that that, that, will, that, that will help them succeed. I think we also, also we, we need to do a better job of follow-up afterward and helping our employers do follow-up with, with, with the candidates who show up there. And some of those some of those techniques might be helping them with a with a model uh, email, a model maybe a short model plan on how to how to work the list of, of attendees. As we all know, one of the most precious things you can get out of a career fair is the list of people who signed up to come, and not just the people who actually came, but the people the list list of people who signed up. And we've sent that out in the past, but I think we need to do a better job this year of instructing our members on what to do with that list. Because I guarantee you that the, the recruiters from Temple and the recruiters from, from Penn State and the recruiters from Geisinger are working that list for a couple months after the, after the event and getting, getting some results, probably. I think also we need to be careful what we promise. This goes back to setting goals. We really have very little control over who shows up. We have, control, we have some control over who signs up and how we get the word out. But when push comes to shove, if somebody says, look, I've had a long day, I don't feel like going to that, or guess what, I just kept, accepted a job yesterday, so I'm not going to that career fair. We, we can't promise that, and we can't, we can't affect that at all. So I think we need to, what, we're, what we need to do is under-promise and, and over-deliver, and that's what we're, that's what we're trying to get at. Um, everybody's desperate. Everybody is, 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 is trying to get whatever they can out there as far as uh, hiring is concerned. And, and that is not a really a positive environment. That's not the kind of environment we, wanna, we want to uh, nurture at these career fairs. We, we want, we want, I want our employers to step up to the plate, to you know, stand proudly at their, at their table with some good handouts and some good information and say, you know, excuse the, the, the French, damn it, we do a great job. And we do a great job for people here, and we would be a high quality employee, high quality employer for you to consider, and a great job for you to have. And so to do that, we I think we need to equip our people. We need to we need to give them we need to give them some we need to help instill confidence in them and help them understand that that what they do that, that how they portray themselves at these career fairs will really determine who they get to talk to and who and who takes them seriously down the line. So some upcoming changes, that some tweaks, and this I've already covered some of these, but we, we are moving to a new venue in Pittsburgh, and I think what, what Amanda said earlier about choosing venue, it really is very important, and it took us a couple years to figure out that the venue we had in Pittsburgh really was a hindrance. It was, it was it's on the campus of the University of Pittsburgh, and if you know anything about healthcare in Pittsburgh, it is 
ground zero for the battleground between large health systems in the United States. It's one of the ugliest healthcare markets in the United States when you have you know, two large health systems there and, and, to, and one of them is, is the University of Pittsburgh um, UPMC. And they are, so there are people who will not darken the door of Pitt um, and who will not come on campus there from Pittsburgh and who won't come to something there. And plus, it's, a, it's Friday night on a, on a college campus, and so it's crazy um, and in a very fun way, but it's crazy. And so, we, we, so we're changing that to a venue that, our, that we actually got some input from our employers. We had a couple different ones, and we, 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 we threw these dates out to them uh, and these locations, and boy, they picked this one unanimously. Um, the, the downside is that I'm going to have to come to that come to fly into Pittsburgh from, from Nashville, from the 3R Net meeting in Nashville. So it's going to be interesting um, to, I'll, I'll be showing up there um, and then jetting off, and then, then getting a taxi off to the career fair and uh, it's going to be a long day, but that's okay. Um, we're also going to be, we just need to make sure our members get special treatment. That's that's uh, some of the, another change that we're going to be doing that I, that I talked about. The, the fo whole focus on experience and what happens there and not just not just having a bunch of tables set up around the room and, and hope for something positive to happen, but really trying to build a good experience. Um, we're we're thinking about doing something specifically for physicians, and particularly in Pittsburgh, the the group of people we want the most, but the group of people we have the hardest time getting there are docs. They have so many options. They have they, they have career MD and practice match. Uh, career fairs going on, and it's just really, really difficult to get them there. So we're thinking about doing something different from them. This year in, in Pittsburgh is the Family Medicine Education Consortium, which is a, North, which is a consortium of, of family medicine residency programs in the Northeast. They're meeting in Pittsburgh in late October, so we're thinking about doing something in conjunction with them. And otherwise, maybe having a social doing something at a, at, a, at a pub or something along that line uh, and inviting uh, family physicians to come in and, and, and meet us there. Those things are difficult. They're just, it's just very, very hard to get docs to come out to something like this. Uh, I mentioned earlier about perhaps a traveling career fair of some sort, going to various, maybe taking our career fair, taking our, taking our display or booth uh, and a few employers directly to some training programs and setting up there. And I just think also we need to focus on what happens after the career fair uh, in a much better way. By the time these career fairs, and because our, our annual meeting is less than, by the time this last one's done this year, our annual meeting will be less than a month away. Sometimes after these career fairs, we, it's just like, whew, glad that's over. <laughs> you know, we got, that, we got through that. You know, it was good, it was bad, or whatever. But it's done, and I can move on to something else. And I think really so much of what happens, so much of the success of a career fair really happens after the fact. And we need to do a much better job of following up and being in touch with people and nurturing those connections, nurturing those relationships throughout the year and not just when it's not just when we need them to show up and and meet our employers. Um, one last thing that I talk about and then we can take any questions you we you have is we I've I've seen I've gotten some inquiries and seen some stuff, for instance, on on the PCA workforce development. Face-to-face, uh, -face, um, the online thing, and also an ASPR, and so the places about virtual career fairs. And we did look at these. We looked at two platforms: one called Brazen, B-R-A-Z-E-N, and another called Shaker, S-H-A-K-E-R, and just like it sounds. And we we vetted these. Of my workforce committee, we looked at these. We had a small group that looked at these and and did some demos. We they were. They, they were selling them pretty hard. They were, the, the, particularly for Brazen, the, the salesperson was, was pushing pretty hard. But the cost is really pretty high, and it really is kind of a, it, to say, use an old phrase, a pig and a poke. We really don't know what we're getting. You don't, we, we don't know what's inside that bag and how it's going to, how it's going to play out. And our, and our employers, our FQHCs, don't have the kind of money the, 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 we were estimating for the one we were we were we were leaning toward that the cost would have been about five or six hundred dollars for per booth at a virtual at one virtual career fair, and 
that was cost prohibitive. We just couldn't we couldn't uh, we couldn't do that. Now there might be some other options out there. We want to keep an eye on it, but um, you know, I, I, like I said, the you know virtual career fair is called that because it's virtually impossible to estimate the potential, to estimate the success, and really figure out whether it's going to work for us. And we don't we don't have that luxury to do that. So. Uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about our investigation in, in the virtual career fair. So that's our presentation, and I'll stop stop there. And if you have any questions, great. If not, we can we can chat later. Thank you so much, Judd. That was wonderful. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in, um, and okay. so since we have a few minutes, I'll ask you now: um, What is your average attendance at your career fairs? I did want to mention this. Um, the attendance, like I, I think I said earlier, the attendance has not gone up. Uh, matter of fact, last year um, it went down substantially in Pittsburgh. Went from about 50 the year before to 30. We had 30 candidates show up and 11 employers. In Philadelphia, we had 80 candidates show up and we had 31 employers there. And that was our record for employers. I don't think we'll have that many this year because some of them were position practices that were only there to meet docs and they did not meet many docs. Um, so I don't really have an average, but that was what it was last year, and it was down in, in both places. I know I can tell you that our our show rate, our no show rate or show rate, whatever you want to call it, it's about 50%. About 50% of the people who sign up actually show up. Thank you. Um, next question um, is, is about the people you're aiming the fairs at, are your fairs only for clinical staff or do you do any focus on QI or informatics staff? Uh, so far they've just been on clinical staff um, and we're going to try to expand that this year to include more behavioral health staff uh, uh, providers. Um, yeah, we have not done any kind of administrative people or informatics people, uh, informatics professionals haven't done that yet. Uh, we'd be op we certainly would be open to that if we have somebody who, who we, we actually have had a couple people like spouses show up. I think we had a spouse show up like two years ago in Pittsburgh who whose who's husband or I forget I think it was a, the wife was a physician and the husband was a was a, was a was a computer guy and he did have a couple conversations but that was just by by happen chance. Okay, great. Um, next one is: Do you notice? Do you ask your employers that are attend your career fairs um, if they've made any placements based on people they met at your conference, and kind of what's your evaluation follow up there? Yes, we do. We follow up with them. Uh, Shelley takes care of that. We follow up with them like we do, pretty much like we do with our referrals. We we give them when we send them names off the free R net or practice link or whatever. We 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 we, we follow up with them. To see if they've if they've hired anybody, and we've had some success. We've had we've had actually a couple of years ago we had somebody hired three people out of one career fair, and none of those three people were actually at the career fair. They were all friends of people who were at the career fair, and so so we count we counted those as placements because they were you know, they were as a direct result of of our efforts. So yes, yeah, so we do we do some follow up and. Again, if you're working, as you know, if working with F2HDs and employers, they're extremely busy. So it's, we, we badger them as much as we can to the point where we think it doesn't, it's not wise to badger them anymore. But it's hard to get feedback, and we need, we, that's an area that we need to continue to improve. Great. Um, another question coming in is, do you invite health centers from other states? What's your marketing for those, or would you be interested in having them at your career fairs? Uh, very simply, no. We are Pennsylvania specific. You got to be in Pennsylvania. You can. We actually have a we have a um, urgent care chain that recruits that that has come to our career fairs, and we tell them you can be here, but you can only recruit for for Pennsylvania jobs. You cannot recruit anybody for outside the state, and they're they're very they they respect that. So we are funded by the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and. Everybody else can just have your own daggone career fair and stay away from Pennsylvania. <laughs> so, no, that's a good question, but but and 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 Pennsylvania is a net um, exporter of of providers because.
because we have seven medical schools here, we have a large number of CRMP programs, so we know that people are going to leave in the state, but we are specifically Pennsylvania. Great, and I know we're coming up to the hour, but just one last question. Um, if, if you were in a state who was just excited about getting these career fairs setting up and you were, were looking for some first steps for how to get this process all started, what are the first three things you would recommend um, another PCA do to get this process started? I think the first step I would do is to go to your board or go to, um, if you have a workforce committee or a membership committee or whatever, and go, or, or, or if you have HR contacts, go and ask them, are, would, you be, would you be willing to exhibit at, at a career fair? Would you be willing to come to uh, the central location um, or to one of these two urban centers and spend an evening doing this? Because if, they, if, they're, not, if, if they're not on board, you, then you've got. Then you've got. The next step would be to educate them and to get them and to, to bring them about and, and educate them to do that. Um, I think the next, the step after that would be to look at your budget. What can you afford? What can you swing? How, um, you know, what kind of event can you can you have? Do you need to go to a place that has that might give you free meeting space, but might not be the most desirable location, but you but it's free? Do you, you know, kind of how much food can you afford? Are you gonna have to bake your own brownies for that? for the career fair. And so look at that budget. And then I think the third step would be to start working on your network. Uh, and you probably, uh, we all have networks but of varying sizes. But to look at your network and start thinking about, okay, where do, I, where do I need to do, what do I need to build to my network so I can start, so I can get the word out about these career fairs in a way that's cost, that, when I say cost effective, I mean free, in a way that's virtually free for me to do. Because, like I said, we don't have much money for, for promotion. We have a few hundred bucks for promotion, and that's it. So, um, you know, the, I, I would say that those are, you know, getting, get, making sure you have, you, you have, you're going to have some people interested, uh, getting your budget together, and then working on your network. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jed, for this presentation and answering the questions and your expertise. Um, I really got a lot out of it. I know um, from the notes we've been getting that other people um, also did get a lot out of it. The, the rest of the notes uh, were really just about how brilliant and amazing you are, Jed. So I won't take oh, the well, time to read them aloud now. Well, um, <laughs> well, but, and and we, we would do this for, for the right price. We would, we would plan your career fairs for you. But we're expensive, so. Um, but Amanda and I would we'd quit our jobs here and go to work for Amanda <laughs> Incorporated. I uh, like we're, it. We're happy to help out. Please, and, and please, if, if you have questions, just email or, or call us, and we'd, we'd be more than happy. And we can give feedback then to, to Allison about questions that are asked of us, and keep that keep that circle going. Well, thank you so much, Jen and Amanda. Thanks to everyone for joining us and for sticking around to the, the end here. Uh, we have recorded this webinar, and we're going to send you a copy of that recording and have it available on our website. Um, you're also going to get a, a little evaluation when you close out, so please just take a few mo moments to fill that out. Um, we appreciate you, and uh, we're here to serve, so please be in touch at any moment if you need anything at all. Uh, thanks again to Judd, and hope you all have a great day. Bye.